Sometime in the not too distant future, a motorist who breaks down in a remote area of Australia will take his spare engine out of its box, replace the faulty one, and drive on. That might sound a little fanciful, but the remarkably light and compact Surridge engine could well make it possible. This week we were privileged to see for the first time just what makes the orbital engine tick. This remarkable achievement is the result of a fantastically short period of uh, devotion, of uh, dedication, of cooperation sparked off by the genius of a, a young Western Australian citizen. This is a joint venture. BHP have not taken over the Sarage Enterprise in any sense, in any way. This is a 50-50 venture between the Sarich partners and BHP. Mr. Sarich is the genius behind this development and he is continuing to control the development here in Western Australia. And I think BHP's main role at the present time is to give them every backing they can to enable this development to accelerate. We are now at a takeoff point. We are extremely confident about this engine. We've come across no difficulties that cause us to feel we've made any mistakes. And now is the time to start moving very quickly. There'll be a great deal of testing of the engine and parts of the engine leading through bench testing to car testing, road testing that is. And we do hope that by the end of this year we shall be in a very good position to know what the future is to be. It was indeed a remarkably short time between conception and prototype. So short in fact that Ralph Sarich fully deserves Dr Ward's description of him, genius. Sarich explained to Ron Bairstow the principle of his engine. Yes, we've um, adopted a principle here of uh, orbiting motion for the piston. Uh, the major reason for this is to uh, provide um, sealing areas which are easy to seal. In other words, they retain their angular relationship to any seals. The, uh, it also reduces the frictional velocities, which has been uh, the downfall of uh, many rotary engines so far. Now, the piston actually goes in a circular manner like that. Uh, without rotation, in other words, um, it simulates virtually the moon going around the Earth. Uh, so it for, just uh, the power pulsing it pushes the piston in a circular direction. Um, these uh, slides here, or vanes we call them, they form the combustion chambers. Like between those two, there is a combustion chamber which is equal to a cylinder of a reciprocating piston engine. Uh, although uh, we say they are equal, uh, the expansion cycle is slightly longer, so that a seven-chamber engine, in fact, has, uh, would be equal to about nine cylinders. So the engine would have uh, a higher frequency than, say, a uh, V8 engine. Um, the sealing of the engine has been all carried out with simple flat strips, but, uh, in fact, the sealing that you see on this engine is obsolete now, and uh, there's been some major developments as far as sealing goes, and the engine will be, in fact, much simpler than it is right here. What were some of the major problems you had to face when you were designing this engine? Um, the major one probably was, like everybody had, was sealing. Uh, although uh, the orbital motion enabled us to have much easier sealing, there were still problems when you get axial expansion of the engine, in other words, the widening of the engine, uh, due to heat, because uh, the material expands and then the seals must follow it. Uh, without leaving holes in the uh, combustion compartments. You have managed to solve this problem? We've solved that, yes. Uh, this has been, again, a serious problem with most of, uh, almost all rotary engines. How does this engine compare with the Wankel rotary engine, which has, has been hailed by some people as the engine of the future? Um, the Wankel rotary uh, obviously is uh, an engine of the future, uh, and uh, it's certainly smooth, and uh, it's got many advantages. But we're claiming here, and this is our own claim and has been confirmed by uh, you know, people, universities and this type of thing, uh, that by having only one piston for any number of firings, uh, it reduces the number of component parts. The engine is much simpler to produce than the Wankel engine. It requires no sophisticated machines or uh, materials. Um, you can, in fact, um, increase the diameter without any significant increase in frictional speeds. The, uh, 
engine is always very compact. As you see it here, this engine could be widened one and a half inches to increase the horsepower by 50 per cent. Those involved with development of the engine are cautious about the time needed to get it into full production. Ralph Sarich says a lot of time and money must be spent on intensive testing and development. Dr Ward was asked about a timetable for the work. We hope to have our first phase of development work completed this year and be in a position to make decisions about production. With luck, this means that we will be setting up for production in 1974. So it'll be at least two years, might be more, depending on our success with the development work. Are you definitely aiming to produce this engine in Western Australia? Oh yes, yes, this is our objective. Have you got any other thoughts on other applications for the engine apart from motor cars? Yes, this has been one of our difficulties. There's so many possibilities. You could use it in lawn mowers, in motorboats, industrial applications, aeroplanes. But to crystallise things, we had to decide to go for one prime mover. So we picked the automobile, which is a mass market. What's the unit cost likely to be in comparison with the conventional reciprocating piston engine? Well, Ralph Sarich thinks it'll be about two thirds the price of a conventional engine, which seems reasonable which would put it less than a hundred dollars, which is quite remarkable. These vanes fit to slots in the end plates. The idea is for bearing loads to be transferred to the end plates rather than the outer housing. The vanes are then fitted to the orbiting piston member. Vane to piston sealing is achieved by installing seals within the inner radial face of the vane. Other seals prevent leakage between the vanes and the housing and the vanes and the end plates. The vanes have legs with lugs. These fit and slide in slots constructed within the piston side faces. is placed flat on the bench. The end plate's oiled. Then the end plate's placed on the orbiting piston member. Now the end plate is eased into position. The specially shaped cranks are located within the end plates and journaled into the sides of the piston. Any tendency for the piston to rotate is taken within the end plates. The circular outer casing is placed in position. Best way to see the orbital engine's operating principles is to place it on a lathe. So far, top engineers haven't been able to find a major flaw in the engine. It seems likely that the orbital engine will have many advantages over the conventional reciprocating piston engine that now powers most cars. Among the expected advantages are good torque and power characteristics, together with a simplicity of manufacture and a smooth power pulse in a very compact unit. Preliminary tests indicate an incredibly high power weight ratio, even in the prototypes. Further development is likely to result in even higher power weight figures. According to the experts, this is the most exciting development of the internal combustion engine since the start of the century. Whichever way it's viewed, the future seems rosy for Ralph Sarich and his remarkable engine.